from Triple E Media. I'm Ramat Mohammed, and this is The Backstory. extraordinary couple of days in the Nigerian National Assembly, both houses finally passing the long-awaited electoral act amendment. The approval was made conditional on the Electoral Commission getting clearance from the National Communications Commission and approval from the National Assembly. The Senate has rescinded its decision on electronic transmission of results. The upper chamber has now empowered INEC to determine the procedure for the transmission of results during elections. But another bone of contention, it will seem, has come up. And this is about the way political parties conduct their primaries. Nigerians await the president's decision on the recently passed Electoral Act Amendment or Electoral Amendment Bill. We'll begin tonight with President Muhammadu Buhari's withholding of his assent to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill 2021. I, I, actually, I think that what is going on is that we are focusing on some aspects of this, um, this uh, and leaving the most critical one. On Tuesday, that's the 21st of December, President Muhammadu Buhari, he sent a letter to the Senate President Ahmed Lawan. And in this letter, the President essentially gave his reasons for why he rejected the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. And all of his reasons came down to just one clause, Section 87. Now, when the Electoral Act Amendment Bill was being debated back in July of 2021, there was no mention of Section 87. No one even looked in the direction of Section 87. At that time, the main focus of intense debates, which lasted for days, were amendments that were being proposed to Section 52. Amendments to this section would allow INEC, that's the Independent Electoral Commission in charge of our elections. Those amendments would have allowed them to deploy methods that they determined would enable fair elections, including electronic transmission of election results. That was the debate that was happening back in July. Fast forward to October, and all of a sudden, we've all forgotten about Section 52, and we're all focused on Section 87. Anthony and John, what happened? First, we have to quickly take you back to July. On the 16th of July, the House of Reps agreed to allow INEC to decide how it would conduct elections, which basically meant that INEC could implement electronic transmission of election results and eventually they could deploy electronic voting. That same day, the Senate also agreed to allow INEC to deploy electronic methods in elections, but with one condition. INEC had to get sign off from the NTC, that's the Nigerian Communications Commission. They're in charge of our telecommunications industry. And INEC also had to get a sign off from the National Assembly. INEC was not happy about that because this essentially makes them no longer independent. But the Senate had spoken and then they went on recess. Eight weeks later, they are back in session and lo and behold, the Senate makes a U-turn. They now agree with the House of Reps, so they removed the conditions and allowed INEC to decide how they want to conduct elections. We're not sure why they made the U-turn. Maybe they had eight weeks of Zen yoga and had time to come into harmony with the natural order. Or maybe they realized that adding those conditions were essentially illegal and wouldn't stand up in court. Whatever their reasons, on October 12th, the Senate granted INEC their wish. And they even went further to amend Section 43 and Section 63 in addition to Section 52. All these three sections are related to the voting process and the amendments strengthened INEC's autonomy over those processes. So INEC is feeling pretty empowered at this point. But before the INEC chairman had a chance to pop open a bottle of non-alcoholic champagne, the Senate president started to pull on a piece of string. He 
proposed an amendment to Section 87 of the Electoral Act. Section 87 essentially regulates how political parties choose their candidates. The first subsection reads, A political party seeking to nominate candidates for election under this Act shall hold direct or indirect primaries for aspirants to all elective positions, which shall be monitored by the Commission and the results of the primaries may be endorsed or certified by the Commission. This basically allows political parties to decide if they want to hold direct primaries and let all party members choose the candidate, or if they will hold indirect primaries where only select delegates choose the candidate. So the Senate president proposed an amendment that removed the word indirect. Basically, the change would require all political parties to hold direct primaries. Now, remember we just told you that amendments to sections 43, 52, and 63 all had something to do with the voting process and making that stronger. So you're probably wondering, what brought Section 87 into this? Well, we're not sure, but maybe it had something to do with what happened on Tuesday, the 21st of December. We'll begin tonight with President Muhammadu Buhari's withholding of his assent to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill 2021. One could argue that Section 87 was brought into the picture in order to engineer that specific outcome, the president's veto. But hang on, isn't it possible, just possible, that our senators and our representatives, they truly believe in representative democracy so much that they're willing to finally share power with us, the lowly people? Okay, let's indulge you in that fantasy for a minute. If what you say is true, then the proposed amendment is a huge deal. And it would have massive repercussions to the political class. So you would expect the Senate to spend hours, if not days, debating the amendment. But when the amendment was proposed in the Senate, they spent a total of less than 20 minutes discussing it during the plenary session. 20 minutes? I think this episode might be longer than that. Exactly. So is it possible that they introduced the amendment to Section 87 because they really want to share power and deepen our democracy? Sure. Anything is possible. But it's more probable that the clause was amended to engineer the outcome that we saw on December 21st. And there are two intended side effects of introducing the amendment to Section 87. One intended side effect is that it makes the president and his party look like the bad guys, which is a really important thing to do because next year is an election year. The other intended side effect is that the media and public's attention has been effectively distracted by the debate around direct versus indirect primaries. No one is talking about Section 52 and the electronic transmission of election results anymore. Okay, so let's talk about Section 52 and the electronic transmission of results. Why is it causing so much anxiety? Well, we have to take you back to the episode we released in August. In that episode, we explained the different steps in our voting process and the ways they can be corrupted. Now, for the most part, we've managed to remove corruption from the process, except for the parts where votes are transmitted to the center for collation after the counts are done. This collation step is done using paper and pen, or pencil and eraser. And that's the part of the process that INEC is fighting to make electronic. Making that step electronic removes the middlemen in between counting and collation. But it seems like INEC is in this fight alone because the political will to back them is just not there. All along, INEC has been saying that they are ready and capable of transmitting election results electronically. In September, INEC released a position paper where they clearly indicated that they are ready. In that paper, they explain to Nigerians that they have been experimenting with processes and technologies for over 10 years. During that time, the commission developed the INEC results viewing portal, which they've actually tested in off-season and by elections. So they've solved the technical issues. But when it comes to the debates around the Electoral Act, we all know it's not about the technical issues. It's 100% political resistance. Where is the resistance coming from? Is it the legislatures or from the presidency? It's probably both. But the only way we will know is if the National Assembly were to remove the amendment to Section 87 and resubmit the bill. Now, even after that, the president could still choose to not sign it, just like he refused to sign back in 2018. 
In 2018, just like right now, the National Assembly decided to go to the president with the amendments to the Electoral Act. They chose to do this one year before the elections in 2019. At that time, the president refused to sign, stating that it was too close to the election and that he would assent after the election. Now, at that time, the president was seeking his second term. But President Buhari is done with his second term in 2023 and he's going back to his farm. So he would have nothing to lose personally if he assented to the bill, assuming the National Assembly returns it to him without the offending Section 87. But his political party, APC, may have something to lose. And the president's party is his legacy. He might not want to jeopardize his legacy. But we'll wait and see. Never say never in Nigerian politics. Now, that same day, the 21st of December, when the Senate received the president's letter, they went into a closed-door executive session to deliberate. That session lasted about 45 minutes. The next day, Wednesday, they had another session that also lasted about 40 minutes. And in the end, the Senate president came out and said that they would need to consult with the House of Representatives and their constituents. But of course, the House of Representatives had already gone into recess. So the saga will continue when they come back from recess later this month. Politics is a numbers game, and this is especially true when it comes to the democratic political system, because fundamental to that system is that people must participate directly or indirectly through representatives. Now here in Nigeria, we run a system of representative democracy where we elect members who then go on to make decisions on our behalf. For the politicians in this system, democracy poses the unique challenge of having to convince people first to vote and then to vote for you. Now it's a lot easier to convince 100 people than 1,000, easier to convince 1,000 than a million, easier to convince a million than 10 million and so forth and so on. For the politician, the fewer the number of people that actually participate, the fewer the number of people they need to convince, the easier their job. But low turnout also benefits the electoral system. Our electoral system, as it is today, will probably break if everyone that is eligible to vote actually goes out to vote. In 2019, the voting age population in Nigeria was over 105 million. About 84 million were registered to vote and only about 29 million actually turned out to vote. For the politician and the political system, this is a perfect outcome. But this outcome didn't happen by mistake. Certain very calculated steps, very specific speed bumps, are put in place to make sure that most of us in democratic systems don't vote. The first speed bump are the technical issues. Technical issues are really important for making sure that there are inefficiencies which will frustrate people, especially people in the urban centers, the big cities. The big cities are populated with young people, young people who are getting more and more used to just pressing a few buttons on their phone to order food in 30 minutes or less, or pressing another set of buttons to transfer money in less than a minute. These people don't have patience for technical inefficiencies. And when they run into technical inefficiencies, these people just give up and move on. So you can effectively limit their participation by introducing technical issues. Now, the beauty of technology and process is that they do improve over time. And the number of people with voters cards will continue to go up. This is a really scary prospect for the politician and political system because it means more potential voters in the future and they would have to work harder and spend more money to convince this new pool of voters. With improvements in technology and process, it means that the political system has to find a way to limit how many people who are eligible to vote actually show up to vote. That's where the second speed bump comes in. You introduce fear, uncertainty, and doubt into the electoral system. It's time to make you feel like your vote doesn't actually matter like the system is somehow rigged so that you feel like there's no point in going out to vote. Maybe this is when you start to read more news stories about how INEC is not ready, like how the voter register is filled with the names of dead people, or how bandits, terrorists, and political thugs 
are going to be waiting at the polling station for you. Right around this time, you'll get more stories about the government's squash and dissent, and so forth and so on. The point of introducing fear, uncertainty, and doubt is to get you to a point where you choose to give up. You decide it's not worth it, and you stay home. And the people who are more susceptible to this form of propaganda are city people, the young urban population, the same people who have no patience for inefficiency. So the remaining number, the 25 to 30 million that actually vote, that's a more manageable number for the politicians and the political system. It's a number that they can control in a predictable way. And really good, really great campaign planners and political analysts, they know how to identify these people. So when INEC tries to introduce technical innovations that increase voting efficiencies or that increase voter confidence, that's a problem because it means more people will vote. And more importantly, it introduces more people who might vote in unpredictable ways. So in the face of all these forces that are trying to ensure that you don't vote, what do you do? You vote. The Backstory is a Triple E Media production. Production copyright 2022 Triple E Media Productions. If you enjoyed this episode of The Backstory and you would like to hear more, go to our website at 234audio.com to play the sample content. Then download our app from the Google Play Store for even more episodes. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at 234 Audio to watch the video for this episode. Make sure to click the notification bell, like, and leave a comment. Our episodes can also be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and leave a comment because it helps other people find our content. This episode of The Backstory was produced by Ramat Mohammed, Antonietta Kalunta, John Iwoji, Dominic Tabakaji, and Sam Tabakaji. Special thanks to Mala Iwa Badu Ikaleku.